and minerals. Um, they also have a potential for income uh, opportunity, income general opportunities, climate change resilience, and also they have been found to have high antioxidant content, the scavenge for radicals in the body and make the body less predisposed to uh, some infections or diseases. And of course they can contribute to elevation of malnutrition. So actually African indigenous vegetables compared to other conventional vegetables have been shown to have a competitive advantage over some of these uh, uh, potential that I've mentioned here and uh, they are not being optimally used. We've done a study comparing some of the vegetables. Most of them have a high contents of, for example, minerals compared to the conventional cabbage, the, the, the cabbage that has been bred, not the original one. Uh, now I am not uh, able to move my slides. I don't know why. Uh, maybe if you click in there and in roll again. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, I'm going backwards. So okay, I've done that. I'm going backwards. Okay. Okay. So now I want just to talk about if we have this potential and we have these uh, bio resources in Africa, uh, indigenous vegetables. What is the issue? Uh, we also have looked at the major constraints. One of the most important major constraints we have observed is negative mindset and maybe ignorance because many of us have looked upon these vegetables as poor man's crops. Other issues that are contributing to low production and consumption is inadequate research and publications. Although a lot has been done as I'll, as, as I'll share, there's inadequate quality seed and lack of technical information, lack of appropriate recipes for African indigenous vegetables. That's why Winnie will share some of the recipes she has developed, high post harvest losses and poor policy framework. Although I want to say at this juncture, despite these major constraints, we have made some strides at least the past 10 years with, re with regard to African indigenous vegetables. Now, because of these African indigenous vegetables uh, contribution and advantages and the highlighted constraints, AIV research initiative was formed way back uh, in 1991 uh, at uh, JKWAT and uh, Maseno University. And the main focus was a multidisciplinary research program, which was initiated. And basically the goal was to strategically reposition indigenous vegetables for food security, sustainable development to ensure that there's adequate production, consumption, and also uh, utilization of these vegetables for food security, for nutrition, for health, and also for income generation. So this has been a long-term uh, kind of initiative that uh, maybe I will highlight as we go along. So in that aspect, of course, when you have a program, you must uh, look for funds, do projects. So since 1991 to uh, as late as 2018, we have had 20 funded projects, uh, which are multidisciplinary, multi-institutional, and also participatory in many ways, involving as many participants or uh, uh, many of the people along the value chain. So I've just... I've just highlighted some of the projects. Uh, I think the one which is missing here is the one which is being completed this year, uh, Amazing Amaranth, which is started in 2018. So we've done quite a number of projects uh, in terms of promotion of African indigenous vegetables. And I want to say that in these studies, we've done uh, baseline studies, household studies, seed and uh, seed multiplication and characterization, physiology, agronomy, nutritional, socioeconomic, recipe and product development. And all this work has been done in partnership with many other collaborators, some of which are here and also students. A lot of students have been in this program. 
Now, one of the uh, outcomes of all this study is to identify priority African indigenous vegetables in Africa. There's one particular project we worked on, funded by the EU, and we wa worked in uh, seven, I think, eight African countries, and we were able to identify some of the key African indigenous vegetables within the African continent. And this is what this slide shows. And some of the vegetables also are particularly shown there for those who are not familiar with them. The other thing we have done, apart from just doing the research, we saw that mindset was one of the issues. We have done a lot of advocacy and promotion in various ways. We have done oral media, poems, song and dance, exhibitions, demonstrations, print media, radio, and even using the internet. Uh, one of the studies also have shown new trend content, new trend uh, uh, density of these vegetables. But the one I want to mention about is the GAIN study, which looked at three vegetables, of course, comparing tomatoes, kale, and amaranth. And uh, what we did in this study was to have the fresh and dried amaranth, because we know that uh, uh, in Kenya, sometimes we have high production areas, uh, periods, and we need to dry the vegetables or we take to areas where there's no uh, rainfall. So we did this and uh, we looked at uh, how much of the dried vegetables retain most of the nutrients. And uh, the study showed that uh, we had the solar dryer and the commercial dryer, and we were able to demonstrate that even drying, you could still remain with some reasonable amount, about 50% of most of the nutrients are retained. So in cases where you need to dry them and transport them outside Kenya or even other, other areas, you can still have uh, a, substanti a substantial amount of the nutrients. The other thing we have done is recipe development. And this was we were done with communities where we looked at how traditional these vegetables are being uh, how they are prepared and also developed recipes. And uh, we standardized all this preparation. This was because many of the young people were not able to know how to prepare them to ensure that they optimize on this. So we have that as well. Then we had also capacity building and uh, uh, curricular development. This actually has been done in various universities. We have introduced these vegetables over the last 10 years undergraduate and postgraduate projects, a training of, of World Vegetable Center of African researchers, uh, about 300 of them, which are where I was involved. Farmers, uh, we are also training farmers, 15,000, and we have trained 14 policymakers in one of the projects. So we have actually looked at a multi-system uh, strategy to see that we try to reach everybody that matters in this area. So. Uh, we have looked at that, and out of that, we also have publications. And I want to say here that the publications that we are talking about here are not just scientific papers, which of course we have, but we have also leaflets, uh, DVDs, and online platforms. Of course, if you go online, you'll find a lot of information that we worked on with our partners on African indigenous vegetables in an endeavor to make them, to make it uh, available to all. Then we have had seed production systems, because we saw one of the challenges was seed. And as the, Dr. Kinyuru said, we have worked on seed and even later we'll show you, we have released some of the seeds. We do distribution of seeds all over Kenya. Uh, we also have conservation uh, of these indigenous vegetables. This was particularly at Maseno University. We established a university botanic garden where we are actually conserving over 200 plants and 10% of which are indigenous vegetables. Mentoring is very key, and that's why Winnie is here. In our research as senior researchers at the university or research institutions, it's very important to do mentoring. So this just shows the mentoring that we have gone through, both uh, in my research endeavor in JKUAT and also Maseno University, where I worked before I came to JKUAT. So in a nutshell, this slide shows that Research that we've done has resulted into quality seed, uh, dissemination materials, products, and these vegetables are now even available in supermarkets. Uh, that is now giving in an overall, if looking at it from 10 years ago up to now. 
Uh, here are some of the varieties that I released in 2016. Uh, these are nine of them. Uh, they are not uh, uh, crossbreeds, they're just selections for, from the collections we made in many parts of Kenya. We characterized them and uh, described them and they were actually approved by KFI. So they are actually right now we are trying to compare, to, to, to share with the farmers to see their preference. Because many times you come up with varieties and farmers are not able to accept them. So this is what we are doing at the moment, especially with soft DI that are here today that they can share what we are doing with them. Because of this work, uh, we find that uh, the vegetables have become very uh, popular and they've been known globally. For example, the Nature Magazine on 9th of June, 2015, talked about this as super vegetables. And I believe that sustainable development goals uh, uh, cannot be realized in Kenya and Africa without involving the role of African indigenous vegetables. Now, sometimes referred to African super vegetables. Uh, this is a slide showing that uh, in 2015, when the head of state visited JK Watt, he got interest in these vegetables. And of course, from that day, we have had commercialization of these vegetables being spearheaded by the government. And we have been doing trying to do this at the moment in Vika County and Kiambu County, so that these vegetables can also contribute to the big four agenda of the government of Kenya. And uh, among other uh, uh, crops, the vegetables have now uh, been recognized as important in contributing to food security and uh, nutrition, food and nutrition security. Now, uh, as I said, we've been, been doing this work for a long time and we continue to do it. The latest activity we have had in the recent past, as late as uh, uh, September 2019, We've written a book because as I said, as you do research, you do research, uh, you publish scientific papers, but it's very important to have information that can be shared with the producer. So in one of the projects called Hotinilea, which was funded by the German government, BMZ, we had a book being launched. We came up with a book, I was one of the co-authors, Production and Marketing of African Indigenous Vegetables for Extension Workers, which was launched in the year uh, Kiambu County on 17 September 2021, as you can see in the pictures. This book is available, a soft copy, and also a few hard copies we have. Now, these are mostly for producers, those who want to produce. And uh, soon in the other project, Amazing Amaranth, as we will expound, we have also come up with the recipes, and we are, going, we are working on a recipe book, which will also be shared. So if you're interested in this book, by any chance, we will, you will get it. But if you get any of my emails, I have attached it as an attachment to distribute this book as widely as possible. So it's something that we can use for those who are, who are interested in production and simple information for promoting the consumption, production and consumption of these vegetables. So what we are saying is these vegetables have a part to play and all of us have to take a part. What I've given you is just a summary. There's so much information online. There's so much information you can get directly from us. We have many, many activities, but this was just to give you a heads up of what we've done in the last 30 or so years on African indigenous vegetables, not just me alone and with other partners. That's why today I have invited one of our collaborators whom we have worked with on the ground. There are many collaborators. I mean, I cannot mention all of them. We have research institutions, we have uh, industry, we have seed companies and many other people. But for today, I've chosen to have one of our partners of BI uh, that have, we have worked with them since 2016 when we released the varieties and they've been helping us to work with the farmers to see which uh, seeds or which varieties are preferred and then a student uh, in a way of mentoring because we need to mentor young scientists to take up when we go. So at this juncture, I think I want to stop and invite the soft DI team to give us their presentation. Uh, thank you. I'll stop sharing so that the Autumn can share and continue with the presentation to where I've left. Thank you for listening to me.
Okay, so um, my name is Autumn Cotton, and um, as you've heard, I'm I'm the director of um, SoftDI. Um, let me just switch this. Hold on one second. Can you see my full slides? Not yes. yet. Okay. Uh, slideshow. And now? Yeah, yeah, we're good. It's now. okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, I, I just want to first start by thanking you, um, Professor Abakutsa and the university for the invitation and um, also for the good collaboration that we've had over the years and that we're continuing to have on the promotion of ALVs um, on the farms and in the diets of the farmers in Western Kenya. So <clears throat> I wanted to start by providing a bit more context about SoftDI, where we are, how we work, and um, hold on just one second. So um, I'm having a little bit of a technical problem. Hold on just one second. Okay, I'll just have to keep my video off if that's okay. Um, so I'll start by providing a bit more context about SoftDI, where we are, how we work, and the training pathway for farmers and how ALVs fits into that. So um, I'm, I'm pleased to be joined by our colleague, Isaac um, Masika, who's also gonna be able to share more about the practical side of our implementation and some of our experience um, on the ground. So um, to start, SoftDI was um, started over 15 years ago um, by our founder and uh, donor, Bridget Frey. And um, she has long been supporting the work of African leafy vegetables um, in this area. And she was introduced to Professor Abakutsa in 2016 through um, Professor Karonchi. And it was around that time that we started our collaboration. And um, we've since been eagerly uh, following the progress of this research and the release of, oops, oh, sorry, the release of these, um, these new varieties. So, um, As you, as you heard, SoftDI stands for um, Sustainable Organic Farming and Development Initiatives. And uh, we have the sort of fairly common goals of reducing malnutrition and uh, poverty and um, just creating livelihood opportunities for smallholder farmers. Um, we're unique in that we're, we're not a typical NGO that runs a project for a few years and then moves on we have the benefit of uh, dedicated funding. And so we're focused on one geographical area and our programs are interwoven to tackle multiple issues over the long term. Um, so we're, what we're trying to do is help farmers adopt more sustainable practices to improve their food security, dietary diversity and um, resilience to changing conditions. So. Uh, a cornerstone of this work is also our spring protection project, which without that, um, our efforts to improve nutrition and health would really be sort of undermined. So here, this is what I want, I want to show um, 
just an overview of where we are working geographically and how our groups are distributed. We're based um, in Western Kenya and we're operating in Vihiga and Southern Kakamega County. The, um, the, the yellow pin here is our office, which is sort of halfway between, between Kakamega and uh, Kisumu. And our, our farmers groups and um, beneficiary groups are sort of spread throughout this area. So we have a team of about 16 staff members who are, are moving uh, to and from the field from our base. And our team consists of agriculturalists, nutritionists, as well as um, specialized staff focusing on climate change issues, agroforestry, and um, our community seed banking project. So here I just want to sort of over give you an overview of um, the beneficiary groups that we target. Um, our what we call sustainable farmers groups are recruited from the communities where we have a presence through schools and through our spring protection work. Um, and they're taken through a whole um, pathway uh, and training that covers all aspects of sustainable and climate smart agriculture. And um, our mother's project uh, targets expectant mothers. So they're uh, recruited you know, in early as, as early as possible in their pregnancy so that we can um, also introduce them to these farming practices and uh, nutrition trainings and provide them with inputs so that um, they can have good nutrition and health during their pregnancy and during the child's first thousand days um, starting from conception. We have, um, we work in over 60 schools and through that, we're engaging with 4K clubs there, um, trying to get children engaged in farming early so that they can not only facilitate the um, school to home technology transfer, but so that they can also see the potential of pursuing farming as a viable and um, dignified career path as well. Um, also in schools, we're, we have an, a, a homegrown school feeding project, which so far has been primarily focused on um, enriching the premix with uh, soya. And now we've started to introduce um, amaranth as well. So some of the schools will be alternating with those two um, combinations to just help improve uh, nutrition for these young pupils and, and their ability to engage in school as well. Um, and then as mentioned, we do um, spring protection. So uh, we've done, we've protected over 1300 springs in this region, which is really a lot. It's sort of a critical mass. And um, we've, you know, that's been a sort of gateway to reaching farmers and farming groups in the past. And um, it, it just, it, our work on that front continues sort of parallel. And as I said, it sort of is an essential piece of helping improve health and, and uh, reduce malnutrition. So this is just sort of a, um, some impressions of, of our beneficiary groups. This is a group of farmers being trained on, um, on how to, obtain and interpret soil testing uh, results. This photo in the bottom left was just taken this week. This is one of our nutritionists. They're rolling out the amaranth enriched version of the, the school feeding um, project. And in the center, these are some of the former, former uh, 4K club uh, members. And um, on, the, on the right, some of our spring beneficiaries, one of the springs, this spring in particular reaches a, a primary school. So you can see them there at the inauguration. And in the top right, we have um, one of our first cohorts of mothers and their ch children. So if you can imagine, they were recruited while they were still pregnant with these children. And here they are pictured um, probably at the point of around the children reaching two years of age. So just to add, some color to, to the picture. 
Um, and then th I want to sort of place the work we do with ALVs within the wider context of the full training pathway we take our farmers and mothers through. Um, the combination of uh, complementary trainings has really contributed to the success of, of ALV's cultivation in, in the groups that we work with. Um, so all of our farmers are taken through a week-long training on all aspects of sustain sustainable and organic farming. Those are sort of outlined here. Um, to a large extent, the training begins with a focus on soil health and ways to restore and maintain soil fertility. Composting is a key piece of this, and it's actually something that we are requiring of our farmers. Um, we're also encouraging crop diversification and rotation, um, trying to get farmers to do more than just uh, maize cultivation. Uh, we train on nutrition to help promote the consumption of a variety of these various nutrient-rich crops especially including um, ALVs. So if you can imagine the program consists of this uh, foundational training and then we sort of move to on-farm trainings um, which span multiple seasons and allow us to introduce the different agronomic practices for each of these crops uh, in an on-farm setting and give demonstrations and more uh, practical um, trainings on each of those. So as the farmers, as our farmers progress through uh, this program, they at some point sort of reach a graduation phase where um, they're still, we still consider them to be part of our network and we want to be offering them ongoing um, services and access to resources as, as a community and a network. Um, and then they're um, we're giving them additional trainings, of course, as, as they come available and, you know, as we can roll them out. But um, this is sort of the pathway it takes. And parallel to this, we're, we're trying to have all of the inputs that we supply for these different crops available through the, the existing groups that we have. So um, we're training our more promising and engaging groups on how to cultivate different inputs um, and multiply seeds so that we can have an ongoing supply as we induct new farmers into this pathway. So this is just another way to sort of visualize our program. Um, rather than having disjointed programs that focus, focus on isolated value chains, we're working across all aspects of sustainable farming. Um, our, our pathway is really designed to give smallholder farmers um, an entire toolbox of technologies to make them more uh, nutrition sensitive, climate smart and self-sufficient and ultimately um, more resilient. So as I mentioned, we start with the sort of fundamentals of soil health and we have a real strong emphasis on composting and, um, and starting from the beginning, we're uh, promoting crop diversification and uh, nutrition sensitive agriculture and, and the, the seed supply chain that sort of helps us be able to um, deliver that. So we use um, a demo site model with each of our groups. This then becomes the place where the groups can continue to gather over multiple seasons and learn the different planting technologies and practices for all of the different crops that are promoted, you know, in, in different seasons. Um, we train, uh, we're, we're, because, you know, we can't neglect the Important, you know, the cultural importance of maize. We're we're trying to, um, you know, also just get farmers to be cultivating that in a more sustainable way. Um, and so we we have certain aspects of the program that that focus on that, including um, CA, and um, 
we train on organic pest and disease management methods and encourage those where possible. Um, and with regards to fall armyworm, we train on push-pull technology. And um, yeah, we have teams in, in our different regions who are, are coordinated so that we can, we can you know, take action as necessary and, um, and support the, the farmers in, in case of major um, pest issues or disease outbreaks. Um, so agroforestry is also a part of our training pathway. We want um, to help farmers generate more sustainable and renewable resources on their farms and also have um, fruit bearing plants and fodder species as well. Um, we're incorporating medicinal um, plants as well and we give training, training on those. So um, that's that also goes goes a long way. Um, we have a uh, very successful weather and climate information service, which disseminates weather forecasts and corresponding agricultural advisories. Uh, for this, we were uh, we were awarded a Tecalisa Prize actually from UK Aid and the, the Kenyan government, and this is this is an ongoing resource for our, our entire network. We incorporate livestock and poultry keeping. Uh, for example, all of the mothers in our program receive a batch of chickens, three month old improved chickens that they can um, generate eggs from and then they can ultimately be raising chicks as a source of additional income as well. Um, so because this is such an extensive pathway, uh, we're able to really build cohesive groups and nurture them. And we do that explicitly with group dynamics, focus trainings, and um, you know, helping them build leadership skills and deal with conflict within groups so that they can sort of stay, stay together over the longer term. And that also is what makes us sort of a good partner on the ground is that we have these sort of ready groups that are, um, that are functioning well already. So we also support families and encourage wise planning for children just as another means of helping manage food security. And once our groups reach a certain stage, we're trying to take them all through um, training on village and savings, village savings and loaning uh, associations so that they can just, it just sort of reinforces their strength as a group and um, allows them to also venture into agribusiness opportunities. And it's really beautiful to see them maintaining such generous um, social funds and they're keeping personal savings safe and making so that they can also make investment in the futures, their futures and their children's futures. Um, and so we, we also support larger efforts to enter into agribusiness. We, and reach some scale. For example, with soya, we've established and continue to support two um, uh, cooperatives. So just a few more images on, on some of the work in, in the field. And this is an overview of the more nutrient rich crops and fruits we're promoting. Soya, as I said, has it's long been a value chain we promote as have ALVs and OFSP. We do a quite, quite a bit with cassava and other traditional crops. Um, sorghum last year we, we implemented into some push-pull sites and all of the farmers are receiving TCB, papaya, moringa, as well as other agroforestry um, species and medicinal plants. So now I just want to get a bit more, a bit closer to the, to the, the way uh, to specifically the way we work with ALVs. Um, I just wanted to sort of give a sense of how many farmers we've been able to reach. So the, this is tracking just since um, 2012. Um, we've, this, is, this is the number of farmers total that, have, that we've delivered training to on ALVs and also 
provided with some initial input. And we've been focusing primarily on these five varieties. Um, so for all of the reasons already shared by Professor Abakutsa, this work in promoting ALVs, it's it's always it's been hugely important to to our founder and just it's their nutritional value makes them such a huge resource to the households for their for their health. And um, originally, when we started the project, we found as well that the lack of access to seeds, poor production techniques and lack of knowledge on preparation were the main hindrances to widespread adoption. Um, and our approach has been to focus on overcoming these through capacity building on various planting techniques that are suitable for ALV production, including bag gardening, um, raised beds. Um, we, we have mandala gardens as well. And our, our overarching emphasis on soil fertility and composting and IPM has really helped the farmers increase their yields because those are so important for for the um, productivity of, of, of ALVs. Um, we've also implemented cooking demos, held food fairs, and our Mother's Project trains on how to incorporate ALVs into complementary feeding recipes for their young children. And it's also included in the dietary recommendations for, for expectant mothers. So, what we found is that once trained, the farmers are very keen to cultivate and consume ALVs. Um, seed continues to be an issue. So over time, we've trained uh, a couple of seed producing groups to help address this issue. And we're now wanting to sort of decentralize the production of seed and encourage more on-farm seed saving as well as um, community seed banking, which we're also facilitating. Oh, Tom, if you could move faster because of time, we are running out of time, please. Okay. So um, this is just sort of the history of our, our collaboration with Professor Abakutsa and the university. Um, it started in 2017 with um, the first activity, which was, uh, was incorporated, included a training and also sort of a way to get gather feedback from farmers on the um, agronomic experience and the the actual like consumption qualities and taste preferences from the farmers. So that was in 2017, where Professor Abakutsu came to our to our area and worked with um, a number of farmers there. In um, 2018, we were pleased to have her join our field day um, with, that, was, that was hosted by our founder. You can see them here. And a lot was showcased on, on ALVs. Our colleague Isaac, who's also with us, he uh, was able to attend this amazing Amaranth workshop in 2019, um, which was very insightful. And in July of this year, we've uh, reconnected with the team and are, are pleased to be able to receive new quantities of seeds which we're now working on multiplying in order to scale out to our farmers. So these are the seeds we've received just recently and um, we're excited to be so these are these are what we're currently working on multiplying in in the field with our seed produ producing groups. Um, we're also looking forward to having a training from uh, Professor Abakutsa and her team on seed saving and um, best storage practices so that our staff can roll that out to our farmers. And here are some current images from the field. We are, this is one of our seed producers managing compost. Um, this, is a, this is a seed producer with our youth group. We have a site at our office where we're doing some multiplication. And here's one of the um, the um, pumpkin seedlings doing doing well there. So our way forward to really make these seeds more widely accessible is, is to formalize our community seed banking model um, so that we can maintain clean quality planting materials that our farmers can multiply at a more local level. And um, 
so far we've focused on training certain groups, but we're now moving to building a seed saving and um, to building seed saving and multiplication skills within our regions, groups, and even at the household level so that the seeds are accessible on an ongoing basis. Um, so ultimately, once farmers are sort of graduated from our program, we want the seed to be to be still accessible to them through a more um, community seed banking model and so that they can continue to contribute to that and also benefit from it. So we're really grateful to the work that Professor Abakutsa has put into this because it makes, um, it makes it so much easier to have done the groundwork knowing what varieties are preferred and you know what, how to cultivate them in the field. So we're excited to make these ALVs sort of the centerpiece of our, of our seed bank um, stock and be able to scale those up going forward. So I think I'll, I'll end it there. I think these are just some of the benefits of, of community seed banking, which, which we hope to, um, to benefit from. So I just wanna um, thank, thank Professor Mary Abakutsa again for this collaboration. And, and I hope that we'll be able to continue working toward the goal of, of of really popularizing these varieties and making them widely available. So I'll end there and stop the sharing. And uh, turn it over to Winnie. Winnie, if you could take the minimum time possible, we will really appreciate because of time so that we can have a few questions and comments. I can see several questions and comments. Uh, so if you could take like five minutes, that will really be very good. Okay. Good morning, everybody. My name is Winnie Akini Nyonje. I'm a PhD student uh, at JQuart taking food science and nutrition. My work is basically on indigenous vegetables specifically the leaf amaranths. And those are just some of the pictures of amaranths, um, the various varieties of amaranths that are available. So my research was uh, under the project Amazing Amaranth that just ended. And part of my research was to use the recipe approach to improve amaranth nutritional quality and consumption. So some of the components of amaranth are nutrients and it also has non-nutrients. Uh, including fiber antioxidants. And it also has a problem of antinutrients that is specifically oxalates, which are known to bind nutrients, making them un unavailable for the body. So uh, what can affect the nutritional quality of a vegetable, any vegetable that is uh, grown, include pre-harvest factors, that is the production practices, harvesting practices, post-harvest factors, including handling, uh, packaging, storage, and cooking. So in preparation on, in cooking of the vegetables, it's advisable to cook the vegetables before eating. And traditional cooking methods are known to, be pro to uh, involve prolonged boiling and also fermentations. Though currently there are various recipes, uh, including single, singly cooked vegetables or in combination with other foods and other vegetables. So the nutritional related factors that can affect the, the, cook, the quality of a cooked amaranth include varied cooking methods, anti-nutrients as, as I've mentioned, and the non-heme nature of the, amaranth in, of the iron in amaranth, which has generally low bioavailability. The general steps that are known in cooking <clears throat> include plucking, washing, boiling, and also stir frying. So when I come to the recipes under the Amazing Amaranth project, the aim to develop the recipe was to increase the consumption and improve the nutritional quality of cooked amaranth. So the recipes were developed under five nutritional themes, which I am going to go through with you in a moment. So the source of the recipes, um, we first conducted a consumer survey in Kenya and Tanzania, various parts of Kenya and various parts of Tanzania, 
where we are collecting information on the utilization practices and also the cooking practices. And we collected uh, 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 various uh, number of recipes from the consumers themselves. We then subjected these recipes to some screening and it suggested improvements. We also did a laboratory um, work to see if to see how, how cooking affects the nutrients in these vegetables. So from the laboratory work, we also tried to enhance iron bioavailability and found that vitamin C boiling and also mixing with other vegetables actually enhance iron bioavailability in the vegetables. So when I go to the recipes, um, our first theme was to have high nutrient dishes. And this is related to the factors that um, there is poor handling and also prolonged cooking, which affects nutrients in the amaranth. So we proposed improvements such as cooking, uh, shorter cooking time and also addition of other nutrients which introduce more um, nutrients and bioactive compounds. So here you can stir fry amaranth, uh, you can steam, or you can also use uh, carrot while cooking. Theme number two was to improve iron intake and bioavailability. And this was informed by the laboratory uh, enhancement that I just mentioned. So here we were um, proposing to uh, introduce some boiling, introduce vitamin C. You can actually add lemon juice into your cooked vegetable to improve uh, iron bioavailability of that vegetable. So it can also be cooked together with other vegetables to improve the general iron content and bioavailability. To enhance taste and flavor, this is uh, based on the fact that amaranth has mild flavor and therefore not acceptable to some people. And some people have also been using milk to enhance flavor. But research says that milk has a, a compound called casein, which may bind iron. So you can only use milk if you're not interested in the iron in th that vegetables. So here we um, propose addition of ingredients that improve flavor. You can use coconut uh, milk, groundnut paste, or even addition of spices. Amaranth has an ingredient, ingredient in other foods. This is just to <clears throat> improve the consumption of these vegetables. Because of its tenderness, it can be used to soften tougher vegetables such as cowpeas, because of its mild taste, it can be added to spider plant, the bitter spider plant, to uh, reduce the bitterness. It can also be added even in other protein foods such as beef or even meat. And lastly, uh, the fifth theme was to enrich street foods with amaranth. Um, this is because most street foods are known to be high in fat and carbohydrates and therefore considered unhealthy. So amaranth can be added into um, kachumbari maybe that is eaten with uh, other foods. And it also can be used in other foods such as bajia or samosa. So under these five themes, we made about 20 amaranth based recipes that were compiled into a recipe book. The book is about to be published and it will be shared with anybody who will be able to get it. So uh, some uh, cooking habits that we encourage include washing before chopping, blanching or short boiling, use of oil, which enhances uh, the uh, pro-vitamin A in the vegetables, addition of vitamin C. I said you can add even lemon into your dish. You can mix also with other vegetables. The discouraged include uh, washing before chopping before washing, drying in direct sun, prolonged cooking use of milk, too much salt and reheating re several times. So these recipes uh, we have done a demonstration and also we have done a sensory evaluation and they were found to be very acceptable. So I will end it there. Thank you for listening and eat more vegetables. So I will just take it back to director to facilitate the questions and thank answers. You. Thank you very much, Winnie. And thank you very much, Professor Mary. Uh, Autumn and uh, Winnie, thank you for those very elaborate presentations. It's really amazing to know that Professor has really been working on edible, I mean, uh, I mean, indigenous vegetables for 30 years or so. And that is really very, very good. And it's, it's commendable. And 
I think this is a very good example of how technology should actually be cascaded down for sustainable livelihoods and diets. And really, this is much, much appreciated. So on the chat uh, section, I'm seeing questions and comments. So I'll probably take a few, not all of them because of time, because we've, we've run out of time, but I'll seek your indulgence for the next probably 10 minutes and then we can end it there. Um, uh, I'll request the members who have presented, Professor Autumn and Winnie, to also post their emails on the chat section so that people can pick discussions with them after this. In case, um, because I'm seeing questions on collaborations, I'm seeing uh, questions on uh, where they can find seeds, etc. So kindly post your, your emails on the chat section and people can get in touch with you for further questions and collaborations. Um, uh, but starting on off with questions, maybe there was a question by Alex Ndirito who is asking, what strategies or projects are there on improving safety of these vegetables? For example, chemical residues, heavy metals, etc. So maybe the question there is, have there been studies that have looked into this? And what strategies have been put in place to improve safety? probably not just on chemical residues, but even on other things, microbial safety, et cetera. So probably that would go to Professor Mary, who can also help uh, to respond on are there small grants to support potential smallholder urban farmers around Georgia? And where can people access seeds from? Are they there in Embu and Meru? And, uh, what other organizations do you work with? So Professor Mary, you want to take those on safety, uh, the small grants to support smallholder farmers. And can people in Embu and Meru access your seeds? Thank you, Prof, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all for the questions. I think the time was too short for us, but we'll try our best. Yes, there have been a lot of studies on heavy metals, one of our PhD students have looked at uh, heavy metals in urban produced crops, uh, vegetables, and also there's concern about uh, a production micro, micro uh, pathogens because of the way people grow vegetables. So what we've done is to provide education and work with other uh, government organizations to re-educate the people because uh, uh, this also comes in when you talk about chemicals, where they use chemicals and they, they don't give it time uh, for the allowed allowed uh, uh, chemicals to go down before harvest. So it's a matter of, we have the information, is re-education and working as a team with other collaborators. That's very important to collaborate. Then small grants, we do not have small grants, but we have an opportunity to work with those who want to work on it in terms of for writing collaborative research, because all my work that I've done has been collaborative, collaborating with anybody, farmers, CBOs, government, and so on. So if you're interested, we can I'll put my email on the chat. I think I have, we can talk more on it about grants if there's any, but we don't have for ourselves, but normally we can work together to write a proposal because actually Indian vegetables have become very, funders have become very interested in funding uh, Indian vegetables. So we can work on that. Now, when it comes to seed, yes, for now we have some seed at the university the seed camp, Kenya Seed Company, they also have, and uh, we are also trying because the demand is so high, even the Kenya Seed Company is not able, and that's why the also DI was thinking about uh, community seed banking. For now, we have another group we are working with in other places, uh, like we have what we call Tatro in uh, in, 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 in Nyanza, and we have Sea Shape, in Kiambu, and we have work with many, many partners. I can't name all of them. There's someone asking if there are the organizations. We work with all that are interested in indigenous vegetables, food, nutrition, where we can collaborate. I said anybody who's along the value chain, starting from the consumers, even restaurants, we work with them to see how they can, schools, we work with them, how to introduce these vegetables. So we work with those who are interested and what we normally do is either re-educate them, we go train them, or we can do a research project together. Uh, and then uh, uh, there is, uh, what was the other one? Other organization, seed, seed, okay, we are seed here. And your seeds are very and embu. Yes, you come, you, you just get in touch, you can get uh, uh, seeds from Jake, Meru and embu, embu is near here. 
we can work out. If you can't come for them directly, we can always you pay and then we send it to you through uh, some, uh, either through a bus or uh, what is possible. So we've been working with people all over Kenya. If they want seeds, we send to them. Okay, people also buy seeds from Kenya seed, but some particularly just prefer to have our seed for some reason. We are not commercially growing them, but we are doing for sustainability and so on. And uh, someone is asking about distribution. We have not actually entered any distribution uh, contracts for now because the first thing we wanted to do is to popularize the, the varieties. For you have a variety and people don't want them. So now we are ranking them, see in Western Kenya, which varieties are needed and so on. And that's the work we are doing with soft BI. So once we know later, then we can enter into distribution and other serious commercialization of the seeds. As per now, we haven't done that. Okay. Uh, I think that's what, G GMO, we haven't thought of a GMO. We haven't thought of GMO, someone does about GMO. Uh, what we want, we just, we just want to refine what we have naturally organic of the seed or, or indigenous vegetables. That may come later, but for now, that's not our focus. Our focus is to refine what we have naturally, the organic types of uh, indigenous vegetables. Thank you. Back to you, Reg uh, Director. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for answering many questions. There was one, uh, the other day I visited uh, some farmers in Nakuru. And yes. they actually just harvest their own sagets. And uh, for, I mean, they get seeds from their own sagets and uh, replant them. So what some Sylvester Kipto is asking, is there a problem with that? What is the effect of just harvesting from your own crop, uh, then replanting the same seeds over and over? What's, what's, what would you say? The, 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 the issue is, for example, the varieties I've released are not crossbred. They're actually uh, just... Uh, the original one. So the, 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 if you can, those ones can be pre-multiplied. The problem normally is hybrids. Hybrids, you cannot regrow your own seed because it, the, 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 the productivity goes low. But for these particular ones, the ones which are just selections, they are not crossbred, they are not hybrids, so to speak. You can regrow them, but the most important thing is to do them in a proper way, proper way of planting, harvesting, and processing. So normally, if they are not hybrids, what affects the quality of the seed is how you process them and how you store them. So if they are just natural ones, which are now, like the ones I've released actually are not hybrid, so you can regrow them, but you need to have the proper agronomic and post-harvest uh, processes done properly for now because of uh, we have not reached optimal, optimal supply, we give that provision. And that's why there's a provision for community seed supply, which, uh, uh, which uh, um, Autumn was talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your response. Um, uh, Esther I th uh, Nampera, I think, is from Uganda, is asking how can Uganda benefit from soft DI? Is it okay if we can plan to collaborate? And uh, another question is, does soft DI work in other areas apart from Western Kenya? Yeah, so maybe Autumn, you could respond to those. Sure, thank you. Um, w as I said, we're pretty geographically focused, um, you know, in, in Western Kenya. Um, but, you know, we're always open for exchanges with other organizations in other areas and um, and just making contact and and exchanging ideas and seeing if there is scope for collaboration, even if it's across borders or across regions in Kenya. So I put my email in the chat. I hope anyone who would would like to know more, you know, they're welcome to just reach out to me offline. Okay, good. Thank you, thank you. So, so feel free to reach out to Autumn to see what other areas of collaborations would be, because I am seeing many questions on uh, why not Kakamega, why not where, and why the choice of your location. I think you've said you're geographical specific, but I think people can get in touch to see what other areas, including urban slum areas, slum dwelling areas. It's an interesting question by Robert who is asking, have you done an external impact analysis of your activities? And he's offering uh, to read some of the evaluation reports if you have done that. I saw that. We have done some external evaluation on certain projects, um, so but not a comprehensive one across all of this. We're, we're, we've been reformulating it a bit. And so once that's 
sort of standardized, our plan is to be capturing um, data at every stage, and then we'll be in a better position to do that. Okay. okay. So. Thank you. Maybe one last qu comment or question is to Winnie. Uh, this is from Freda Rimberia. She's asking, uh, please comment on the relationship between oxalates and iron bioavailability in different vegetables. So what vegetables should we avoid mixing with amaranth, which is rich in oxalates? Well, uh, the oxalate in amaranth, its major effect is actually binding of that iron. So um, I, part of my study was to mix it with another vegetable, which I used moringa to mix with the amaranth. And there was no effect of amaranth on the moringa. So I would not say that mixing with other vegetables uh, interferes with iron bioavailability in any way. You can mix it with any other vegetable. Okay. Thank you very much. So don't fear to mix with any other vegetable based on the studies they have done. Uh, so it, it, it let's eat, like she concluded by saying, let's eat more vegetables. I think we we'll want to encourage that. Um, maybe now, uh, Professor, we are now towards closing before I make announcements. Uh, any, any final closing comments, uh, Autumn, Winnie? And then we can uh, finish with the uh, prof. Any final comments, Winnie? Um, my comment will just be to thank everyone who attended this webinar and also to thank the uh, organizers, Director Research, for allowing me to uh, be part of this. So um, I just hope you will eat more vegetables, as I said. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are always happy to host anybody who is willing. And so feel free to also tell your colleagues that we can do this for them. Autumn, please, your final comments. I would just echo the same. Thank you all very much for the invitation and the and the forum and and for doing this. It's a it's it's a public service to raise awareness of, of this work. And um, the more we can spread the word, um, the better. So thank you. And thank you to um, Professor Abakutsa and her team as well for for the collaboration. Thank you very much. So Professor Mary. Abukutsa. Okay, thank you very much. Mine, I have uh, uh, my conclusion in three ways. First of all, I want to appreciate everybody that has come. I think I recorded the highest numbers almost reaching 60. Uh, I think uh, you actually hit time we shall... You actually hit 60. 60. Yeah. Yeah, yes. so let's have more of this. I think it is a good thing and I'm very, I don't take it for granted for those who honor the invitation. Two, I want to say that there's so much we have done African indigenous vegetables, 15 minutes is not enough. So my email is there. Please get in touch with me if you, have, you need any information, any collaboration, we can work together. I don't have the money, but we can look for the money together. Two, I want to speak as a DVC RP. Uh, actually, Dr. Kinyuru, I am the boss of Dr. Kinyuru, boss leader. But now today is my, my leader, my boss. <laughs> we always have these uh, webinars. And it's not only from within university, even from outside. I know there's somebody who I invite, I said they would like to come and talk about the, the effects of indigenous foods on COVID. So they can be, I will encourage them to give us their, 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 their abstract or the information. So it is only not only for us, we can also have other collaborators. Lastly, as JKUAT actually, uh, Dr. Kinyuru, for those who are members of JKUAT, uh, UMB actually is encouraging all professors to start giving this. I think you are supposed to do a letter to them, I believe. And I think my today's presentation is like leading as an example. So when I come to ask you to give you a presentation, especially the, like what I've given as a senior professor, you know, you cannot, it's something that is wide. So we want more professors to come, of course, to complement with the students and the young, the upcoming young uh, scientists. So I think it's a good thing. Let's keep it up. In you, we are doing a good job. I think uh, when they ask to promote you, I might recommend you, uh, depending on how you continue. <laughs> so, so, so let us continue with this, and I think that's a good thing. And lastly, I have books. I on a, I've launched a book, and we can share the book, soft copy or hard copy. Get in touch with me if you enter the copy, we'll share with you. So let's work together to help the government to 
achieve the, the big four, especially food security and nutrition, manufacturing and so on, so that we have a part to play as universities, as individuals, and where you sit, because there are those who are attending who are not maybe in the university. So thank you so much, let's continue. The university is for the people. The university is there to help the public. It's not an ivory tower anymore. So feel free to get in touch with RPE or the director research or me so that we can continue collaborating to make a difference in Kenya. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much for your engagement. Thank you, back to you, uh, Thank moderator, you. Dr. Kinyuru. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for agreeing to do this. I think we've arranged it for quite some time and finally it has come and in a very nice way because you've brought your collaborators over the years. And I think this is, this is how we like it. We want yes. to see research which is translating to community and to industry and to partners working with you. I think this is really commendable. Just like you mentioned, yes, uh, we continue having this. Our next webinar will be on 10th of November. We'll be circulating this soon. Uh, it will mm -hmm. be on uh, by Professor Marco Tobias Schaffer mm -hmm. uh, from mm -hmm. Utrecht University, uh, on, uh, who is a professor in the area of digital society. He will be, he's working with professors uh, in our School of Computing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'll be sharing this uh, uh, in the coming week for people to also plan to join. So this will be coming to you members. Feel free to do this. Uh, and uh, Professor, thank you very much again. Uh, Yes, like you said, the time was very short. But I would like to encourage you to really, we have a, the conference, uh, the JQuad conference, which is coming very soon. And allow me to just very briefly just um, yes, yes. show you the, the what? The conference, uh, conference website. This is the conference website. It's conference dot uh, jkuart.ac.ke the conference will be held uh, it will be a hybrid conference virtually and uh, physically on 25th and 25th march and so the call for abstracts is out the deadline is the end of november so you still have a few days to put together your abstract so kindly remember us from so you, academia from ngo from industry kindly mm -hmm. visit our website and see where you can fit in and submit an abstract we are looking at a very broad, uh, very broad spectrum. We are looking at in the area of agricultural sciences and technologies, basic and applied sciences, engineering, ICT, policy and governance, medicine and veterinary sciences, uh, water, energy, environment, and climatic uh, man change management. All these areas are welcome. And Professor, with your project on indigenous vegetables, we can offer a session for you, a breakout session on indigenous okay. vegetables. So let's keep talking and see how we can fit okay. your work into a session with your students okay. and partners to share in areas. And this is open to any other projects that feels that they, they, they would want to go that route. We have that option open. So thank you very much, members. I think we want to stop there. We have really gone beyond time, but really from the Directorate of Research, we highly appreciate. But there was Isaac, Isaac Masika, uh, maybe can say something. Yeah. <laughs> Isaac, yeah, it's true. You should say something. I agree. Yes, yes. Sorry, yes, I, I took up all the time. <laughs> yes. Just say. No, you can say something. It's okay. Ten seconds. You are muted. You are muted, Isaac. Um, Isaac, I think he's having technical challenges, but I think. Um, Oh, okay. Yes. So go ahead. Can I say something? Yes, please go yeah. ahead. Yeah, mine is just to say thank you for the organizer of this webinar. Then I think on our side, a lot has been highlighted by, by Madam Director. The time was a bit limited, but I could be, be very much happy to hear that each and every one out of this forum should first of all embrace the Elvis because that's the only thing that can make, make us to live a very happy life. Let's embrace Elvis, let's plant it because as you can see, most of the African vegetables, in fact, they just need a very small spaces. And those in urban areas, like I've seen a question over there, see they can just embrace this using some of the other mechanisms like the back gardens for those who don't own a, a, a wheat farm. So to me, I just say that we are so the idea 
so much appreciative, especially for the collaboration with Professor Mira Bukutwa. I think a lot has been achieved through what we have done, especially on our side. Uh, otherwise, I would like to thank everyone that in this forum that has been able to give out the views, and I do feel that they are going to help other people outside there. Thank you so much for this. So thank you very much, uh, everybody. Isaac, Tom, Winnie, and Mary. Yes, Mary, Mary, you want to say something? No, no, I'm just saying, did you take a photo? Uh, oh, OK. Uh, I think we have Steve Wahoo. Steve Wahoo, please. Steve there. We can take a photo. Steve? OK. Steve. Uh, kindly request you to switch on your cameras, kindly. OK. Yeah, OK. Put on your best smile. <laughs> so Steve, once you're done, you let us know. I'm just waiting for more for a few more cameras, then we do this. Okay, please more people more. should mm. yeah, put on your cameras, people. So that uh, yeah. I well, can, that is I can see we're at 39, to, yeah. If you are able to, well, some of us are. But you know, now Zoom has a very good background where you can blur your background. So you can yes. hide all the things behind you. So don't fear next time to blur your background. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we can take it now, uh, Steve. Okay, one moment, one moment. Are you smiling? Yeah. <laughs> you can say Sageti. Sageti <laughs> Managu. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you okay. very thank much. You, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you thank all. You. Okay. Thank you. See you next time. Okay. See you next time.